Well, praise God. If you have a copy, how many people have a paper copy of uh, God's Word tonight? How many? A lot of digital copies that happen to be out there, and uh, some of the digital copies bring it out. Uh, but if you'll notice around the text that um, Richard just read, if you have the ESV uh, Bible, you'll, you'll notice that there's brackets around that. See that? You know, uh, in uh, fact, in chapter number 8, it really starts in verse number 53 of, ch of uh, chapter 7. And, and there's brackets all the way around it until you come to the end, which happens to be verse number 11, and there's a bracket around there. And there's a reason why the ESV translators have done that. And, and the reason why is because they don't know for sure if this passage of Scripture ha actually happens to be in the Gospel of John. You know, the earliest ma um, manuscripts, manuscripts are these hand copies. They had no printing press back then. And the earliest manuscripts scripts that are nearest to the original actually do not have this passage in it. You know, and so many surmise that this passage was not in the original writing of the Gospel of John by the Apostle John. You know, uh, they, they think that somehow this was an oral tradition that was passed down from generation to generation to generation. Then somebody wrote it down and somehow it came into the Gospel and we have uh, the Gospel of John as it happens to be. Now there happens to be others that happen to be out there when they uh, look at the manuscript evidence, they say it's 1600 years and certainly some of the early copies do not have it in but the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of manuscripts actually have this passage of scripture in and if you look at all of the uh, all of that manuscript uh, evidence, they would say that this is in the Gospel of John. You know there's even some that say when you look at this passage of scripture it might not have been included in but it has all the marks of inspiration. You know, and it was probably some apostle that had written this down about the Lord Jesus and then it was added to the Gospel of John. You know, and there's no way to really tell. You know, it really doesn't change the Gospel again of John if it happens to be in or if it happens to be out. Uh, my particular feeling, and this is why I'm preaching this passage tonight, is that it actually is in. And the reason why I bring, it, uh, I bring that up is it fits the, con uh, the context so well. In fact, we'll see this as we go through this passage of Scripture. It just fits the co context. It fits, again, uh, John's whole emphasis on darkness and light. You know, we see, again, darkness in this passage. We see uh, the sin of adultery. We see betrayal. We see deception in this passage of Scripture. But then we see such beautiful light, and that light, again, comes from the main character, again, in this uh, narrative, and that happens to be the Lord Jesus. And it takes place, you know, right at the end of chapter number uh, seven. And in chapter number seven, right at the end, we've seen that the religious leaders went and told, um, ordered the temple guards to go arrest Jesus Christ, and they can't come back again empty. And so when you look at the religious leaders, in particular the scribes and Pharisees, they come up, come up with this diabolical plan. You, you know, to somehow entrap Jesus Christ with his words, to turn the people against him uh, on, on uh, one sense, or either, again, have, uh, have him commit, again, some crime in the, uh, in the eyes of Rome, and therefore, again, he would be arrested. You know, and it's really a diabolical plan. You know, in fact, one commentator actually said this is the most diabolical, this is the most wicked plan that the religious leaders ever hatched. And in fact, it's one of the most wicked plans in all of Scripture because of the innocence of Jesus Christ. And that's quite a statement when you think again of some of the evil plans that are hatched in the Word of God. You know, we take Lot's da uh, daughters, how they got their father drunk that they might lie with, um, uh, that they might lie with him and be impregnant. We realize again the uh, diabolical scheme of, of, uh, of uh, Herod, you know, and how he ordered the death of all children two years and under, uh, under so he could keep his authority, so he could keep his position. You know, and when you look at all of these things, we recognize there's great evil. And this is one of the things I love about the Word of God. The Word of God does not describe some utopia that happens to be out there. Otherwise, when I open it up, I don't say, I can't relate, this is not my world. You know, it describes the world of sin that I live in. But the real question as we come to this passage of Scripture is what is the greatest sin that we see? You know, and a lot of people would say right away, the sin that we see again right off, it just jumps off the page, this is adultery. And adultery is a horrible, horrible sin, isn't it? You know, when you look at the deception, when you look how it sins against other individuals, you know, when you look at the whole idea that it destroys family, it destroys relationships, this is a horrible sin. You know, and it has been around since the beginning of, again, time, right after the Garden of Adam and Eve. 
You know, and we realize that this sin is even found among the people of God. David, a man after God's own heart, was guilty of adultery. But really, when you look at this, this text, that's not the most despicable. The most despicable, the most detestable sin that happens to be there is the religious leaders who really have no care for this woman. You know, they don't care at all for her. They don't care that this is a lost soul that will spend eternity somewhere. You know, they just look at her as a commodity, some sort of tool to be used for their own evil and wicked purposes of somehow condemning the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you know, and in many ways, this is a horrific passage of Scripture. And, and we come right, right out of chapter number 7, and, we've, and we mentioned last time we were together, much of the pride, you know, much of the arrogance of these religious leaders. And we said again, Pride and arrogance will take you to places that you never thought you would go to and also do and say things that you would never think that you would do and say. And you certainly see this with the religious leaders who are just driven by this idea again of arrogance and pride and self-righteousness. You know, but in the midst of that, you see these glorious beams of light and wisdom. And these lights and wisdom comes from none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, and that's what I want us to look at this, um, uh, tonight. And remember, the whole purpose of the writing of this book is that we might know that Jesus is the Christ and have life through his name. And I believe, again, the more that we stare at Jesus, the more that we look at him again in the scriptures, the more we are enthralled by him, the more we want to follow him, the more that we want to glorify him. So as we look at this narrative passage, I, I want us to see three headings tonight. I want us to see the plot hatched. You know, I want us to see the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the third thing that I want us to see is the grace that is extended. It's an absolutely amazing passage of scripture, but look, let's look at the trap that they set against the Lord Jesus. And you can see that in the opening um, uh, uh, six verses. But let's start at verse number 53. It says, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, I'm sorry, in the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman. What, what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And I'm always surprised at the wicked schemes that happen to be again of man. You know, there's so many that happen to be uh, out there. And God has given us again a wonderful gift, and we all have it. And you know what it is? It's our ability to think. It's our mind. And it's amazing how many people, it's so sad how many people will take that amazing gift that God has given them and use it to hatch wicked and evil devices against others. You know, and I think we all know this, but sometimes we don't know this. When people are against us, they're actively against us, right? Right, right. There's no neutrality when they're against us. They're actively. Otherwise, they're cognitively, they're thinking again about these things. They use their words, they use intentions to bring harm when somebody happens to be against you. They can take the highest, and we can see this again all the way through this uh, gospel. They can take the highest and most noble things that you do, the most gracious things that you do, the most righteous things that you do, and they can turn it on the head, uh, on its head, to mean to make it mean something that it never was intended to mean. And you can see that with Jesus. And we shouldn't be surprised when we have it in our own life. Because if they treated the master that way, then those who are the, his pupils, those who are his disciples, again, will be treated the same way. And you can see the wickedness that goes through, the scheming that goes through this. You know, in this passage of scripture, remember what happened in chapter number seven. It was all around the Feast of Tabernacles. That feast is over now. You know, and so we see the majority of people heading home, all of these uh, pilgrims, you know, many of them going back to the region of Galilee at this time. But Jesus goes up in the Mount of Olives. So remember, he has no home. He has no place to lay his head. But in the next morning, with the people who are left, and many of the citizens of Jerusalem that happen to be again there, he goes back into the temple and he begins to teach. Teach. And this is one of the characteristic activities that we see of Jesus Christ. One of the main activities that we see of Jesus. And one of the main activities that the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders just hated because he had no right, he had no authority to teach the people and also point to himself 
as the only hope that these people have. So in the midst of teaching this large throng that would have been around Jesus Christ, we see the religious leaders enter in. And it's the same religious leaders that we find in chapter number 7. It's the scribes and Pharisees. It says the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst. Now, notice this woman is caught in the act. You know, and according to the law, again, of Moses, you could not just uh, think that somebody, again, is cheating or, or uh, somebody is committing adultery. You just can't have assumptions. You just can't have suspicions about someone. For someone to be found guilty, they actually have to be caught in the act. And the penalty, again, was really se severe. In fact, we think it's dra uh, dra draconian. But the, but the penalty was death. You know, and we look at the wages of sin, and the wages of sin is what? It is death. You know, and it's a far more fearful thing than physical death. It happens to be, again, spiritual death out of the presence of God forever in a place, again, of punishment. But this was so clear in the law of Moses. In fact, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 22, it says, if a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them, both of them, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall purge the evil from Israel, it's amazing, isn't it? Because think about what they're doing right here. Again, they've caught, we've caught this woman, right? But where's the man? Where's the man? And it's amazing how women throughout history, especially when it comes to morality, have been easy targets, haven't they? They many times have been maligned. They many times have been looked upon in ill repute. Well, well the man that happens to be again over here. And let me tell you, chauvinism has been around ad finem. You know, every single age has it. And we can certainly see it in this passage right here. Again, the religious leaders really don't care about this woman. They really, again, ha have no even love for God in this passage of Scripture. They just look at this woman as a means to an end to condemn the Lord Jesus. You know, and you can see this right in this passage because the narrative continues. They said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. And then he say this, what, so what do you say? And it's incredible, isn't it? Because as you look at this, you know, here's Jesus publicly preaching to the people, and you can imagine this big throng that happens to be about Jesus. And here's all these important people. You know, and all these important people cut through, they interrupt his teaching, and they bring this despicable-looking woman. You know, and you can imagine the crying, you can imagine the... Uh, the remorse and the shame she must have felt as she came. Here's this large throng and comes before Jesus at this time. You know, and it's incredible because they say this is what the law prescribes. And the law prescribes stoning. Now, let me just say, the law prescribes death, but it doesn't prescribe stoning. You know, this was just the traditional way that the Jews would carry out the punishment. In fact, again, it was the whole community giving the same verdict that was found you know, judging that person who had broken God's law. You know, but it's amazing because these are the religious leaders. These are the scribes. These are the Pharisees. These are the ones who are leading the people of God. And, and the question we have to ask ourselves, if they are the leaders, why are they bringing this woman to Jesus? And we're told in verse number six, this they said to test him. Why would they test him? That they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and rode with his finger on the ground. And this is a diabolical plan. You know, again, this woman is just a tool. Because you think about it, you know, what say you? What say you to do, Jesus? You know, should we stone her or should we let her go? Those are the only two options. And that's the trap. Those are the only two options. They know Jesus is a man of compassion. He's shown compassion all the way through his ministry. You know, we saw that again earlier in the gospel where he heals this uh, paralytic who has been a, par a paralytic for 38 years. We see him again in the wilderness wanderings where there's 5,000 plus, uh, plus women and children. And he feeds them miraculously. He has compassion upon them, we're told again, of all those who happen to be in the wilderness. And we also see this in chapter number 9. Here's this man who is born blind and Jesus is going to give him sight. And who is Jesus? He's this compassionate, compassionate, again, man, compassionate preacher. You know, and they might have thought, again, this, you know, let's have compassion upon her. Let's forgive her of this infraction. And the moment he would have said that, they would have accused him of being a God hater. And why? Because God burns against sin. You know, how dare you go against what God has said? 
God has already laid down the law of what this woman deserves. You know, and the whole idea that happens to be behind there is to turn all the people against Jesus. And it really is the predicament that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 3. Remember Romans chapter 3? How can God be just? In other words, absolutely righteous, absolutely holy. He cannot look at sin. And at the same time, the justifier, right? The one who shows compassion, the one who shows grace, the one who shows mercy, and still keep his reputation, still keep, again, the glory of his name unstained by sin. How can he bring a sinner to himself? You know, and that's... That's the question that Paul deals with in Romans chapter 3. You know, and there's this option. He could say, forgive her. And the other option is to stone her. You know, I can't imagine that, can you? I can't imagine saying, Jesus said, yeah, it does say that in the law. Okay, okay, everybody, pick up stones and we'll, and we'll carry her out, out, out of town. You know, and you who first, again, uh, saw this infraction, you throw the stones first and then the rest of us will throw the stones. You know, I just can't see Jesus doing that. You know, I can't see, again, the man who said, um, where was it, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 11, and verse number 28, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and guess what I'll do? I will give you rest. I can't imagine him saying that. You know, but you can imagine if he does say it, he doesn't have that authority. Under Roman occupation, the only one who could put anyone to death was Rome, and they would have an accusation against him. You know, so here's these two options, and you can imagine almost this gleeful smile that happens to be on their faces. What say you, Jesus? You know, we got him in between a rock and a hard place. You know, and, uh, and uh, A.W. Pink describes this problem so well. This is what he says. He says, the problem presented to, to Christ by his enemies was no mere local one. It, it means it wasn't just there, right there with that woman. Again, whether to let her go, whether to stone her. It's no mere local one. But look at what he says. So far as human reason can perceive, it was the profoundest moral problem which ever could or can confront God himself. And what is that? That, that problem was how justice and mercy can be, could be harmonized. How mercy can be exercised when the sword of justice bars her way. How can grace flow forth except by slighting holiness? And that's the problem facing Jesus. You, you, you know, which way is he going to go? Is he gonna, going to go towards holiness? Is he going to go towards the law? Is he going to go towards uh, compassion, towards forgiveness? And it's amazing because wisdom does speak, doesn't it? You know, just when you think there is no way to solve that solution, again, who speaks? Jesus. You know, and look at what it says in verses 7 and following in our text of Scripture right here. It says, and, it says, and as they continued to ask him, in other words, they were badgering him to give an answer. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they had heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before her. Now, let me just say this, because, because when Jesus speaks, he speaks with such compassion, he speaks with such boldness, he speaks with such wisdom, and he speaks with this, such authority and power. And we're going to talk about this for a second, but I want us to handle one problem with the text. And one problem with the text is, here, here it is, and this is a question everybody's fascinated with, is what did Jesus write on the ground? You, you know, what did he write on the ground? You, you, you know, because we're told twice in the text that he bent down and he was writing. You, you know, he, maybe he had a stick or whatever it happened to be. Maybe he was doing it with his finger. You, you know, he was doing something. He was writing something. What was he writing? You know, and a lot of people think he was just scribbling. You know, just biding time, thinking, you know, what is the answer that I can give these Men, and I don't think it was that. You know, some people think it was the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. You know, that he was writing down, bringing conviction on these men at this time. Others think that he was um, writing down the um, penalty against uh, false accusers, against false witnesses. You know, these men brought her, uh, brought her to him, but they didn't witness the crime. They just brought this woman who they said was guilty. You know, and there's that. A lot of people think that they, he's writing something about hypocrisy. And I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt what he was writing. You ready for it? Ready for it? I don't know. That's what I know he was writing. There's nothing in the text. 
And let me just say this, that's not the main aspect of the text. It really isn't. We're not told anywhere in the text that, every, that anybody's going like this. Huh, huh, oh yeah, yeah. Nobody reads what he's writing. You know, there's no indication here, but here's what they did. They heard what he said. They heard again what he spoke. You know, and look, at what, and look at what it says right here in verse number 7. It says, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, the law prescribed a couple of different things. One is that the witnesses, you know, to this infraction could not have participated in, in a capital crime. In other words, in modern day vernacular, the getaway driver you know, can't be, again, the, a witness to this robbery that took place and this murder that took place that happened to be again over here. It just didn't work that way. You know, both were guilty. Both would be uh, sentenced, but you could not have witnesses like that. The other thing that you have to realize that is the witnesses to this crime, the ones who were making this accusation, they were the first to throw the first stone, followed by everybody else that happened to be in the community. That's the way it was carried out. You know, and please don't misunderstand the text because I think a lot of times we read that and say, well, you know, that means I can't go to a court of law. That means I cannot give testimony in a court of law if I'm called upon. That means, again, we can't judge anyone at any time. We can't even do church discipline because of this principle because guess what? We all have sin that happen to be in our lives, right? Right? None of us are guiltless. And please, please understand, this is a unique situation. And think of it, because the one who is speaking is none other, get this now, than the Word, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the one who is speaking. And when he's speaking, we, this is why I love the way it ties with chapter number 6, 7, because the one who speaks, speaks with authority, speaks with conviction, you know, and you can imagine as he speaks these words, all of a sudden their hypocrisy, all of a sudden their deception, all of a sudden their hatred is all exposed and having to begin in their heart at this time. You know, you can see it again so clearly, and we realize that about the Word of God. We realize that about God's Word. God's Word is from God. That's why we call it the Word of Possessive God, right? We read in passages like Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, for the word of God, here it is, is living and active. Listen to what it is, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from its sight, but all are naked. This is what happens. And exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And there's such a strength, such a power, such an authority when Jesus Christ speaks uh, that they can't do anything. You know, they can, they can do nothing. And you see that in the response because it says, but when he, they heard this, they went away one by one, beginning with the older, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. <laughs> and I do think it's amazing, isn't it? Because in chapter number seven, right, temple guards, go arrest Jesus, simple Galilean preacher, lay your hands on him, bring him to us. And they come back, and we read in verse number 46 of that chapter, the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. No one ever spoke like this man. And here the, is the same way with the scribes and Pharisees, these religious leaders, they come wanting to accuse, wanting to apprehend Jesus Christ. And what happens? They go away from the elder to the others, one by one by one by one. The elders, again, would, would be the ones with the most authority. And here they go, they depart, they depart, they depart, they depart. And guess who they depart without? They depart without Jesus Christ. I mean, it, it is incredible, isn't it? Uh, John MacArthur writes this, he says, ironically, those who came to put Jesus to shame left to shame. Those who came to condemn the woman went away condemned. And then he says this, unfortunately, their indictment and sense of guilt did not lead them to repentance and faith in Christ. Like many who hear and, fee and feeling the, conviction, uh, the convicting truth of the law, they harden their hearts and turn away from him, not even open to the gospel of forgiveness. And these men should have sought this woman out. You know, that they really used and abused her. They didn't treat her again like a human being. 
somebody made in the image of God, and they should have sought her out and asked for her forgiveness. And they should have sought Jesus Christ and sought his forgiveness and bowed the knee before him, but their hearts are so hard with, with pride and arrogance that they depart from Jesus Christ. But it doesn't take away from the effect of God's word, does it? It doesn't take, a, take away from the effect, again, of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the call is the same in our life. When the word of God is preached, when the word of God is read, when we understand the word of God and what God has said, and there's a conviction, what we do right away is we respond to that conviction. We don't put it off. We don't harden our disposition. But it's incredible, again, to look at this passage of Scripture because we see this trap that is laid by Jesus Christ. And we see the impeccable wisdom of the Lord Jesus when all seems to be lost. But here's the, here's the part I love about this passage of Scripture. You see the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus. You know, and you see that again in verses 10 and 11. Look at what it says right here. It says, Jesus stood up and said to the woman, Woman, where are, are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. It's an amazing passage to see how the Lord Jesus treats this woman compared to the religious leaders that happen to be, um, uh, 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 who, who, who have brought her before him. You know, and I think a lot of people, they look at the Word of God and they look at many of the commands that happen to be in the Word of God and many even the condemnations that happen to be in the Word of God and they use it as a weapon. You know, this is a weapon to condemn others. This is a weapon to really be harsh on others. And that's the way they use the Word of God. You know, and it's not that we don't condemn sin. You know, we, we, we are not fearful of saying, again, abortion is wrong. It's a sin in God's sight. It's the taking of an innocent life. We are not afraid, again, to call out the... Uh, aberrant sexual uh, deviance to, uh, deviations to happen to be out there that are away from the word of God. You know, we're not fearful, again, to call out even the sin of adultery that this woman was guilty of. But it, that's a far cry away from saying, again, we condemn this to not having any grace and not pre presenting the God of grace, the, the Savior of grace, who happens to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think, again, we can do very well in how to treat other people by looking how Jesus treated other people. You know, this is such a, an amazing passage because in verse number 10, Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one, has no one condemned you? So Jesus, think, think about it, because he's been writing in the sand, he's been teaching to people, and then he bends down and he writes, writes in the sand. He has this dialogue with these religious leaders, this very brief that goes on. And, the, and, and then we see these, these words, and they're significant for two reasons. One is, this is the first time that he speaks to the woman. He hasn't spoken to her yet. And secondly, this is the first time he gets up and he looks at this woman. You know, and the reason why I bring that up, it's just like he takes off his, you know, he's been arguing this judicial review that happened to be right there. And it's almost like he takes off his judicial robes before this woman. You know, and he cares for such a wide variety of people. You know, he, 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 he extends grace to such a wide variety of people, whether it happens to be the self-righteous Nicodemus, or whether it happens to be the woman at the well that was guilty of this very sin over and over and over and over and over again. You know, he extends his grace, you know, to this woman. And it's a touching picture. Because you have to realize in that day and age, you know, a holy man, and I'll put that in quotations, a holy man would never, again, even talk to a woman who, was, who had this accusation. In fact, again, men did not talk. Holy men didn't even talk to women publicly again back then. You know, and to, and to talk to her, you know, at this time, he shows such dignity. You know, he shows, again, beyond a shadow of a doubt, although it's marred, that she is an image bearer of God, somebody of worth, somebody of value, somebody who's going to spend eternity somewhere. You know, and he asks her a question, you know, where are your accusers? And I love that question. And the reason why I love that question so much is because it goes at the heart of what the Pharisees are, what the scribes are, right? They really represent the law. And isn't that what the law does to us? It accuses us. It brings guilt and shame, and it tells us that we are guilty. We are shameful before God. We are deserving of punishment. And that's exactly what it does. But then somebody else enters the picture. 
And that other person who enters the picture is none other than our Lord, none other than our Savior. And you can see in verse number 11, this dialogue that goes on in between the woman and Jesus. He, she said, no, no one, Lord. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. And that's so, so important. Listen to these words. Neither do I condemn you. And then he says, go, and from now on, sin no more. It's an amazing passage. Because it reminds us, when we read those words, neither do I condemn you. It reminds us of why Jesus came. You know, we're all familiar with um, John chapter 3 and verse number 16, right? How many people know John chapter 3, verse number 16 by heart? Right? Almost all of you, right? Right? Right, all of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him shall have eternal life, right? right? How many of you know John chapter 3, verse number 17? Oh, oh now, now it's up there, right? Yeah. Oh, I know it, I know it, I know it, right? right? Verse number 3, verse 17 is so precious because it tells us why Jesus came. And listen to what it says. For God, it's even explaining verse number 16. For God did not send his son into the world to do what? To condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So when you look at Jesus, when he's before this woman, he didn't come to stone her. He didn't come to condemn her. He came to save her. I mean, it's a wonderful truth that happens to be read here. And you can imagine the emotions that must have swept through this, this woman this day. You know, here she's caught in this act, and here she's brought before these wicked men. Here she's thrown before this huge throng, this huge crowd. And you can imagine the shame. You can imagine the remorse. You can imagine the guilt that she is ridden in. Then all of a sudden, Jesus begins to speak. You know, and all of a sudden, there's humble joy. All of a sudden, there's gratitude. All of a sudden, there's something that she has not had yet. And you know what that is? It's hope. You know, everything changes. You know, that happens to be right here. And this is what he says. Neither do I condemn you. And those words are significant. And you know why they're significant? They're significant is because of the person who says it. Right? Remember in Mark chapter 2? Right? A big throng around this house. You know, in Mark chapter 2, there's a big throng that happened to be in the house, and they're bringing this paralytic, and he's on a pallet, and they cannot get him in, so they take the roof off, right? You know the whole soon, uh, scene, and they let him down, and just after that, Jesus heals him. But just before he heals him, this is what he says in Mark ch chapter 2, in verse number 5, and he says, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the par paralytic, listen to what he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Right? And to show that he has authority, he heals this man. And think of what he says to the woman. Think of how good news is. Neither do I condemn you. And why is he able to say that? He's able to say that because he is the Lord and he knows beyond a shadow of it. Right, right? How can you be just and how can you be justifier? How can you be absolutely righteous and how can you be forgiven? And here he knows. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows he's going to pay for that woman's sin. Right? And this is what he says to her. Neither do I condemn you. And then he gives her new life. A new aim. Right? Go. Sin no more. I mean, it's absolutely amazing, isn't it? You know, and, and the amazing thing that happened to be there is we see everybody departing one by one. And it's really not everybody. You know, the people who are, who are departing until Jesus is left alone with the woman, the people who are departing are the religious leaders. You know, there's a huge crowd that saw all of this play, play out, you know, and saw the compassion. They saw the wisdom. They saw the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what happened with the vast majority who saw that. They walked away unchanged. You know, and we can so harden our hearts against the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ that we never recognize our own sin and never recognize the goodness of God in giving the remedy through the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what the good news of this is? The good news, if you trust Jesus Christ, the promise in this text is this, neither will I condemn you. That's the promise. You know, trust in him. Follow him. Recognize who he is. He is the Lord of glory. Let's bow our hearts in a moment of prayer. Let's bow our hearts. What an amazing text, Lord. As we look at it, Lord, we see the vileness, the wickedness, 
Lord of hell, many times men have used women, abused women. Lord, have looked upon them and treated them, uh, not with respect and not with dignity, but more, Lord, as a commodity, uh, not with uh, fellow image bearers. And yet, Lord, we see in this passage of Scripture, Lord, the same thing that we saw in, um, in John chapter 4, that, you, that our Lord Jesus treats women with dignity as fellow image bearers. And, Lord, we thank you for that. But, Lord, most of all, as we look at this passage and we look at all the w wickedness, we're struck not only by the wisdom of Christ and the authority of his words and how he answers, Lord, this trap that they had laid, but, Lord, we're struck by the beauty of divine grace, the beauty of divine forgiveness. And Lord, I pray if there's any that happen to be in our midst tonight, Lord, who might be even be watching via uh, Facebook or YouTube or, in, or some other, Lord, mode, I pray that you would use this message to touch their hearts. Lord, that they would look and recognize because Jesus Christ came, because sin has been dealt with on the cross, Lord, for all those who truly trust him, all those, who, Lord, who truly recognize their need. All those, Lord, who recognize the heaviness of their sin and place their trust in Jesus and Jesus alone will have life. Lord, we'll hear, hear those words, neither do I condemn you. Lord, we thank you so much for that great hope that we have in Christ. Just be with us as we go to our, our, our singing celebration that we might sing songs, Lord, that, uh, that elevate the great grace that you have given to us. We thank you again in Christ's name. Amen.